Hello, Women's Bible Study. Great to be with you. I feel like it's been a little while since I've done one of these. Hard for me to imagine right now when and where you'll be watching this. I'm recording on Monday afternoon, and because this is the St. Louis region, I've been a part of somewhere between 20 and, I don't know, 700 conversations today about the upcoming snowfall, um, what things we have to have plans B, C, and D for. And so anyhow, I guess, I guess I'm just thankful that this gets recorded. So whether you are sitting in the church basement or whether you're sitting at home with a cup of coffee, I guess both are good options. So here we go. First, let me say a couple things. One is glad to be with you. Glad you're being a part of this. Um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to jump in and be a small part of it with you. And I also want you to know that I'm really thankful for the section of scripture that we are taking a look at today. My thankfulness to you, as you know, I appreciate that here we are, middle of the year, and you're still a part. You've decided to stick with your sisters and continue to study, and also you've continued to uh, not just study, but also study, stir, serve, and to spend time caring for each other and for other people. I'm really thankful for that. My family's been on the receiving end of that from you this year, and I'm really thankful, and I'm happy to know that um, that you aim that care and love toward other people also. That concern is greatly appreciated, so please keep it up. All right. Two big topics that we hear in this section of First Peter. Two topics that are both near and dear to my heart. We'll take them one at a time, then we'll merge them together at the end. And they are stewardship and suffering. Now, if you have had a parent of a junior high kid any time over the last however many years, you might know that stewardship is one of the things that I pound on in our junior high confirmation class. When we take a look at the first article of the creed, talking about God, talking about his work of creation, one of the things that I want my students to know is that one of the things we learn from the first article of the creed or are reminded by it is not just the truth of it, but that there's some necessary for things necessary things for you and me to be a part of as well. We call that stewardship, how we care for the things that God has created and given. So maybe this is review for you. Sorry about that if it is, but here's what I want you to know. First off, quick definition for what it means to be a steward. Stewardship is managing something that actually belongs to someone else. I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, and so I always remind people if they remember those books or movies, you might remember that Gondor had a steward. He wasn't the king, so he sat below that throne. He was a caretaker, someone who was watching over in order that when the king returned one day, he'd be able to hand it back to him. That's stewardship. So that's a definition. And the reason why it matters is this. It matters because, honestly, stewardship is a way for you and for me to look at all of life. And understanding our role in it is something that can provide meaning and direction for how we live. You might know when I talk about stewardship with my confirmation kids, there are a handful of areas that we emphasize. We talk about the stewardship of money, the stewardship of time, the stewardship of the body, and then the stewardship of the rest of creation. Those are the big topics. What I try to teach them is that God is the one who created all of this. Not only is the, he the creator, he is the rightful owner of all of it. And so what you and I have and how we live is just a way of learning to steward what is ultimately his. Now, in 1 Peter 4, Peter is not talking all that specifically about any one of those four things I cover in confirmation. But the big idea is the same. 
we should work to use well what God gives us. Here in 1 Peter 4, what we hear is that the topic of stewardship, that big idea, is focused on things like skills and abilities. All right, hope that you noticed I uh, changed the color of my screen. I wanted to make sure that you, um, that you Lutherans out there were ready because I'm about to say something that might bother you. Are you okay with that? Well, I guess it doesn't matter if you're okay with it or not. Here it comes. Here's my warning. I'm going to talk about stewardship, and I'm going to disagree with how you have occasionally thought about it. Ready? I feel like whatever happens next, if it bothers you, it's on you. I Look at the screen, right? Be ready. Okay. Here's something I want you to know about stewardship. Biblical stewardship. Again, how we manage the things that actually belong to God, but have been gifted to us for a brief time and for a purpose. Stewardship is not primarily concerned with being cheap. Got it? Did any of my precious Lutheran hearers faint when they heard that? Ugh, I know. It's a tough week. All this angst that we have to spend worried about snowflakes. And then this, a whole lifestyle shattering idea. And see, the reason I feel like it's important to mention that, even though I'm joking with you a little bit, the reason why I mention that is because I have noticed in life, for sure I've noticed during my pastoral ministry, that when I hear someone say some version of the following words, is this the best stewardship? It is almost always meant as an almost identical synonym to the next question, which is, isn't there a way for us to spend less money on this? Stewardship, for many of us, means frugality and cheapness. Now listen, I want you to know that there is certainly a place for that. And we probably learn things like that from wisdom books like the book of Proverbs. I believe in things like wasting not leading to wanting not. You betcha I do. But that is not the pinnacle of biblical stewardship. Here's one of the things I've noticed as a listener over the years. I've noticed that there are a couple of times when, even though I know how the story goes, that I find myself agreeing with the wrong person in the story. Here's a for instance. Do you remember the parable of the talents? This dude's about to leave town for a while, take a long journey, attend his business in another place, whatever it is that he's doing. And he leaves behind talents to some servants. They get varying amounts. Can't remember what it is a bunch to one, some to another, and very little to the last. Well, when he finally does return and asks for an accounting of how they stewarded what he gave, the first two who had received a bunch and a few, they end up doubling. He commends them. But there's a last servant who says, I was so worried about losing what you gave that I dug a hole and hid it. Also, because I know that you are a fierce master and I didn't want to disappoint you. So here you have what is yours. Whenever I hear Jesus teach that parable, I always think, hmm, what a wise thing to do to make sure there could be no loss. But that just shows you how Lutheran I am to my core. Because I've read that parable, and I know what happens to the person who refuses to risk loss. 
What he has is taken from him, and he is cast away. Reminds me also, I experience this like once a year in church. Once a year in church, we're reading about this lady who spends an enormous amount of money on something like perfumed lotion. And she uses it to anoint Jesus. And someone there says, why such waste? And when I hear those words, I think, right. What a good Lutheran stewardship question. Why such waste? Couldn't we have done this for less expensive and use the money somewhere else? And then the text reminds me that Judas is speaking. And if there's one thing I know about reading the Bible is that you're not supposed to agree with Judas very often. Maybe you've heard it this way. You ever heard this one? Hey, did you know how copper wire was invented? Two Lutherans fighting over a penny. Blech. Okay, here's the real pinnacle of stewardship. It is not just a synonym for frugality, for being cheap. The real pinnacle of stewardship is use. We hear that in 1 Peter 4. What we have been given is given to us by God who gives us varieties of his gifts and he intends for us not to dig a hole and put them in so that when the master returns and asks for an accounting of what is his, we say we made sure that we did not lose any of it. God gives us what he gives so that we can use and we should aim those uses in a couple different directions. And these aren't mutually exclusive. You can do both of these at the same time. What God gives us, he gives us with the intention that we use it to serve other people. And in serving other people, we glorify God and show our thankfulness to God, who is the giver of what he's given. We should also remember that whatever it is that God has blessed you with or me with, those blessings are good and useful. And so instead of spending time wishing that we had the blessing that someone else got, we should be thankful for what we've been given and see how we can use it to bless other people. Notice the example that Peter uses after talking about things like being hospitable. He then talks about one who is given the gift of speaking and one who is given the gift of serving. And he does not list them in a way that shows priority of one over the other. He says both of these things are good. So when we gather together, for instance, on a weekend for worship, God doesn't look down at Zion Lutheran Church in Harvester, Missouri, and say, good thing I gave that one person a gift to speak to these people today, and he's the only one I've gifted. No. He's also given gifts of people who show up to serve in other ways, people who show up to elder or usher or serve in the altar guild or be Sunday school teachers or sit by someone who's having a hard time or be a parent in the pew and try to raise their kids in the faith or someone who sings out in a way that encourages someone nearby and on and on and on and on and on. God gives us those gifts, not that one would be lorded over the other, but that all would work to the benefit of the people around us and to the glory of God. First Peter 4 also reminds us of something incredibly important, which is that no matter what individual gifts any of us have been given, no matter how much of this or how little of that, all of us can love. This reminds me so much, you might remember, of 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 where the Apostle Paul is dealing with a church that has prioritized fancy gifts, like speaking in tongues and working miracles. And they've 
privileged those gifts so much that they think only the people who know how to do that stuff are the real Christians who are really living it out. And Paul has to say to them, no, in fact, I'm going to show you a more excellent way, bigger than tongues and miracles is the way of love. In fact, Paul says, love is greater. Love is the one that will remain. And even if he could move mountains but didn't have love, that would be worthless. So remember that we can all love because love covers over a multitude of sins. Here's something I think is really important about stewardship in general. Something I try to impart to my confirmation students. Something I try to remember myself and something I think is maybe important for you also, is that when we recognize that how we live is a stewardship of what is actually God's, I think it brings a little bit of clarity to our lives. See, what we have is a gift. Since all gifts, true gifts, are undeserved, comparison with what someone else got isn't helpful. Because the gifts that we have don't reach their highest point in how they serve us. They're meant to serve other people. Also, when we acknowledge that what we have is from God and that it's actually his stuff, we find our rightful place in the world. I'm not the top. I'm not the center. All of those positions of honor belong to God. And that right there, just by itself, acknowledging that you and I are not the center of the universe, or the most important person in the world, that is remarkably necessary these days. And here's the thing. We as a world have believed the lie that if you were to only acknowledge you as the most important thing in the world, you'll be happier. But the verdict is in, and that's not so. Unless you and I come to grips with our place in the world, which is God is big, we're small, you can't be truly happy. Because the burden of being responsible for all isn't something that you can bear. I can't bear it either. The belief that everyone should be here to serve us, ugh, you'll never be happy like that. Instead, find your spot way, way, way below God. Be thankful for what he's given. Be thankful that he has called you and me to work and gives us good and honest things to do. And he gives us the skills and abilities to carry them out. Oof. And when we're thankful for that, we can be so, so, so much happier. All right, stewardship, part two, suffering. Hey, I'm really keen on talking about suffering. I love it. I love suffering. It's one of my very, very, very favorite topics. Not because I'm weird, crazy, or dark. It's because it's an incredibly important thing to talk about. I know you've heard me say this before, but I really believe this. One of the great benefits that you and I have as recipients of a true and biblical faith is that our faith has plenty of room in it for suffering. And that is so incredibly important. Why? Because suffering is a reality. I don't know when it is in the recent history of the world that we so believe that we conquered all bad things that when bad things happen, we try to shove them to the side, but that is not real. Real life includes suffering. Because real life includes it, you and I ought recommend to others a faith that makes room for it. Not some cheesy faith that is offered to us by a preacher who could very well play a role in an infomercial showing you how good this next thing will make all things be for you, but something that's gritty and can endure difficult times. 
Now, I want you to know that the kind of suffering that First Peter that Peter is talking about here in First Peter four, it likely is more oriented not towards just sort of the random suffering that we receive as people who live in a broken world, things like disease. Primarily, the kind of suffering he's talking about here is persecution. And reading these verses reminded me very much of one of the Beatitudes of Jesus from Matthew 5. In fact, I am quite certain that Peter had that moment of listening to Jesus in mind when he wrote what he wrote. Here's a reminder how Jesus said it. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you. A couple of things that this section of 1 Peter 4 reminded me of, and I wanted to remind you. One is that suffering can be a blessing. Just like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are you when. But also it reminded me that there are multiple different ways of suffering in life. Some undeserved, some persecution. Sometimes we suffer because we've done something stupid. And we should probably think about that in a slightly different way. The reason I mention that is because it seems like a tremendously relevant message to a culture that seemingly prizes victimhood and persecution. And quick reminder, whenever I say the word culture, I do not mean people who only exist outside of the stained glass windows of our sanctuary. This is a cultural issue, offense and victimhood that exists throughout different ages, throughout different value sets, all sorts of stuff. Certainly many people are mistreated unjustly. That's true and sad. But Peter reminds his hearers that when we do things that are wrong and then consequences come, that that is not the same as some sort of holy martyrdom. You know how that can be sometimes. Sometimes people play the victim, but when they explain to you how they arrived where they are, you hear about all of the messed up decisions they made, wrong courses of action they chose, and they feel like, how could this have happened to me? And you want to say, how could anything other than this have come from what you just did? You aren't persecuted. You're making bad, bad choices. So here's the thing. Suffering is sure to come in life. We don't need to race to claim it. We also shouldn't pretend that when we do things that end up bringing consequences to us, that that's somehow undeserved. You do something bad to someone and suffer a consequence for it, that's not martyrdom. That's just how life works. Also, First Peter 4 reminds us that suffering, even suffering that feels undeserved, not, our, not consequences to our specific actions, since that's coming, you and I should not be surprised by it. Instead, what we can do is rejoice in it, Peter says. One of the reasons we can rejoice in suffering as followers of Jesus in this crazy world is because, as he reminds us, our soul has been entrusted to one who is powerful, merciful, loving, He's the one who holds the future in his hands. Here's the thing. No matter what struggles I suffer in this life, I have the glory of eternity waiting for me. When I close my eyes for the last time, I have every hope that I will open them to see the face of my Lord. 
Also, you and I can grow from suffering. Just recently, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly how many weeks ago it was, but I was paging through this book of sermons that I have from an author I really like. Not everything that he says is worthwhile, and not everything he says do I even agree with, but he's a wonderful author, wonderful thinker. And he does a great job of tying the true stories of the broken human condition into a story about the God who loves people in such a condition. Well, anyhow, I was reading a sermon recently where he talked about the stewardship of suffering. And that came back to mind today as I was getting ready to record this. As I saw here in 1 Peter 4, those two main themes stick out, stewardship and suffering. I remember him talking about learning to become a steward of suffering. So yeah, you and I should hear from the first handful of verses for today that we should work to be good stewards of the wonderful gifts and abilities and skills that God provides. I absolutely agree with that. I also agree that we should learn how to be stewards of our suffering. When the preacher that I was reading said that, what he meant was that he personally had grown in his ability to love and serve others because of the struggles that he had gone through and the struggles that he had witnessed from a foot away, people that he had worked to be by their side and shepherd them through. And the reason why I think that is so incredibly important is because there are some temptations that come with suffering. One is that we can spend so terribly much time wondering why this is happening that we might miss opportunity to steward that moment in a way that shows love to others and brings glory to God. Now listen, when something bad happens, wondering why, I mean, if you don't do that for a moment, that would actually be pretty unusual. I don't think asking that question is really the problem. The real problem is being paralyzed after you ask the question and haven't heard an answer. So for me, when bad things come, I try to move myself beyond that why and into what can I do now? I remember a pastor friend of mine told me years and years ago that whenever he preached at a nursing home, that there was one thing that he always included in his message to the folks who were gathered there. And that thing was purpose. Now, listen, I don't know if you've ever been to a little church service in a nursing home. I don't mean like one of the big nursing homes that has its own chapel and has music and people singing and stuff. No, I mean these little nursing homes where you're gathered in a place that's just off the cafeteria and people are working around you. The sound system's no good. The piano is not tuned. And most of the people sitting in front of you are half asleep, ready to be moved on. It's pretty bleak. And it struck me that what he said was so important. He said, listen, yeah, I'm here to talk with you and show my care to you. But I'd also like to encourage you today to remember that even if you are stuck in bed or in a wheelchair, that God still gives your life purpose. It could be as simple as praying for the nurses and other workers who walk into your room to be good and kind to them, to show them a a glimpse of love in what might be a difficult day. I thought that was so interesting. Now I want to make clear that you're hearing something from me. That does not mean that I do, nor would I ask you to think that every single time something bad happens to you, I do not want you to think that I immediately see that God is shaping me towards something else. If my family experienced a tragedy, 
I would not immediately say, thank you, God, for this tragedy. How might I use that to love others and glorify you? I don't celebrate when bad things happen to me or to other people. I don't say to people who have just received difficult diagnoses, good, this might make you a better person. I don't say that. It might, but that's not the time. For me, it's a little bit different. It's an acknowledgement that bad stuff does happen. Doesn't make it all good. But since I can't stop bad things from happening, can't stop them all from happening to me or to you, can't go back in time and avoid it all, I might as well look at where I am sitting right now, even if it is in a moment of suffering, and work to steward it. Because here's the thing, if God is giving me the opportunity to show love to someone else or to glorify him, I should do it. Even if I would prefer avoiding the struggles that made me fit for this moment. Just recently, I was having lunch with a friend and he's had a tough, tough go significantly more difficult path to the last handful of years in life than almost anyone else I can think of. And after spending some time reflecting upon the tragedy that he has lived through in his family, he said something that I thought was so incredibly important. And as I think about it today, is a really good example of someone learning how to steward even the suffering that he's been given. He told me that before this tragedy had come into his life, he told me about how incredibly impatient of a person he was. He said, you know, listen, you did not want to be walking slowly in front of me at a grocery store. You did not want to get in my way whether it was in work or life. He said, I simply believed that whatever I was doing was the most important thing happening. Which is, of course, by the way, how pretty much everyone in our modern world thinks. But then he said to me, he said, but you know, now that I realize that I've spent days almost sleepwalking through life, struggling to put one foot in front of the other. He said, I realize that when it feels like someone is getting in my way, he said, I realize I don't know their story. I am not going to assume that they're just trying to be in my way. He said, instead, I'm just going to wonder, Maybe they have something going on that I'm not aware of, and I should be as patient as I can when that person's around. And I thought, what an amazing stewardship of suffering that is. He's become more compassionate, more sympathetic, because he's gone through a difficult time now he sits in a room and thinks to himself, I bet there's other people struggling here too. Now listen, if he could trade and have back what he once had, he'd do it. But that trade's not being offered to him. Instead, what he's doing is saying, this is the day that the Lord has made. I've got some burdens to bear. Wish I didn't have to bear them. But because I am bearing them, I might as well do it in a way that shows goodness and kindness to people who are around me. And if that glorifies God, good. A couple final takeaways. Life is stewardship. I think that's just a good way for you and I to walk as followers of Jesus in this world. Everything that we have, 
from our possessions to the creation around us, our abilities, even our disabilities, even our suffering and our death can be looked at through the question, how can I use what I have and who I am and where I am to love my neighbor and to glorify my God? And also, because like Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Shouldn't hoard what I'm given. It's not about being frugal today with the gifts of God. It's about using what God has given to us to do those things. To show love to our neighbor and to glorify God. And all the while to know that as you and I struggle and suffer through this life, whether it's under the consequences of our actions or whether it's stuff that just happens to us and we had no control over. You and I get to walk through those struggles with eyes set on Jesus, the one who is crucified to offer forgiveness of the wrong things that we do, was also raised to new life to say to us who are struggling in this world, fear not, for I have overcome the world. Because we get to fix our eyes on him and place our faith in him, you and I get to journey through this, knowing that this, as bad as it might get, it is not the end. And as bad as it is, there's still opportunities to serve neighbor and to love God. So anyhow, so glad you had me with you today. Hope you have a great day. See you soon.